theater with my mother, and I'd play like Colleen Sloan. And, and I grew up with the theater, but I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a little bit intimidating to be here with the hot stage lights. I think you more and more how hard to do the work. Um, I can sort of see that you all are in the audience, and but I can't see you clearly, so because of the lights. So I'd like this to be informal. I have some things I'm prepared to say, but I'm very happy to be interrupted to get questions, comments, etc. So wave if you want to say something, um, because there's a glare of lights that you have to see through. Um, well, as I said, I'm, as Ann said, I'm a theoretical physicist. I grew up in New York City in Cincinnati, and I'm a recent immigrant here to Canada. I came in September 2001 at the invitation of the then about to start our Perman Institute, which we have in Waterloo, which is a very little research institute that I'm very proud to be associated with. And I'm very proud now to be a Canadian physicist, but always. It's hard to get people to remember when I'm excited that I'm Canadian as well as I'm American. Now, I have a long interest in theater and the other arts, and long-standing conversations with artists of various kinds. Um, I see my job as a physicist, and by the way, I work on the same kind of questions that the character in the play Elliot Green works on, which is to say, probing the fundamental nature of space and time and matter, looking for a theory that unifies everything we know all of knowledge. Um, I've been engaged in that search ever since I was about 17. And um, Elliot, as you'll see, is somebody who is obsessively engaged in that search. Um, but that's just one frontier of knowledge, and in some sense it probes our place in the natural world, our understanding of the natural world, but we find ourselves involved in other worlds as well, the world of the imagination, the social world, the world of spirituality, and so science shares the frontiers with people who investigate these other frontiers of these other worlds. And artists and theater people are investigating the frontier of both the imagination and of the social world, those two frontiers. And it's characteristic that these ancient crafts which investigate the frontiers of human knowledge go back a long, long way, in some sense, perhaps to the caves, to where we became fully human 70 or 80,000 years ago in Africa. And certainly, science was invented, some say Anaximander was the first scientist, the Greek pre-Socratic, um, at about the same time the theater was invented, or at least it's developed into something like its present form by the same Greek civilization, the same hybrid of the all the Mediterranean civilizations that get together in Greece. And so there's been a conversation between people on the two different frontiers of knowledge ever since then. And I think that, although I'm not a scholar, I'm not a historian, I think that you can gauge the coherence of a culture by the robustness of the communication amongst people at the frontiers and with people at the frontiers. Because what we're doing at the frontiers of knowledge and the different frontiers, we're really making and investigating the future. And there are different parts of the human future and when people at the different frontiers stop communicating, when we stop communicating with the general public, about our search for knowledge of the frontiers, the culture becomes incoherent, which is, I'm afraid, what our situation is pretty much currently. Um, Danny, how many people here know who Danny Hillis is? One. <laughs> <laughs> Danny Hillis is, uh, is an inventor, is um, what has been called a member of the Digerati, the intellectual of the digital world. He invented the first large-scale multiple processor, what was called a connection machine. And Danny is about the same age as me, and when we talk, he likes to say that when we were children, 
the culture was alive with talk of the future. There was the World's Fair, we both were taken by our parents to the World's Fairs in New York and in Montreal. Um, and the, there was the Jetsons on television. And, uh, but no, that matters. But there, were a lot of, there was a lot of presence of the future in our culture. And that has kind of gone away. There's a sense now that the future is upon us. We're rapidly participating and involving into the future, but nobody talks about it. So I mean, nobody talks about it with the same kind of hope and optimism and expectation that it was talked about when we were children, when Daniel and I were children. And that's part of why I'm interested in time, as I'll come to in a minute. Now, when because of my background talking to people in the arts, uh, I was really thrilled when Ross Madison got in touch with me, um, which was probably the fall of 2013, and said that he and Hannah Moskowitz were engaged in making a play about the nature of time. Uh, they have been working on that play for some time, as you were reading. So now, some of you have seen the play, and some of you have not seen the play, is that right? But as, as you read the program, um, Ross commissioned Hannah to write a play about time seven or eight years ago, and they've been working together and doing projects, develop, I don't know what it's called when you're developing a play, but they've been developing this play for that time. And rather late, I was invited to become part of the process. Um, in the spring of 2013, I had published this book, Time Reborn, which is a popularization of a project that I've been engaged in with a Brazilian philosopher. Brazil, by the way, is the country of the future and always will be, they like to say. Um, but my friend, Roberto Mangueira Amber, who's a Brazilian philosopher and also a politician, He's presently Minister of Strategic Affairs, or as the press there calls the Minister of the Future in Brazil. And we had been engaged in a project to reimagine the concept of time, and I'll get to that in a minute. And the popularization of our project was this book, which Ross and Hannah had apparently read, and incorporated some themes from in the play rather late in the development of the play. Um, so, I, so I was asked if I wanted to meet Hannah, and I, I had heard of her, of course, as one of the great young playwrights of Canada and the world. Um, it's very interesting being an immigrant, being, being an immigrant into Canada. You, you kind of want to, but you kind of also don't want to say things like great Canadian playwright, because she's just a great playwright. <laughs> and I think you'll agree if you've seen her in plays or when you see this one. Um, there's this weird cultural barrier coming from this weird country to the south. <laughs> but um, we shouldn't let that inhibit us. Anyway, I was very proud to be asked to, to talk with her about the play. And we met for a coffee, which went on for a couple of hours. And she unfolded to me the basic ideas, the basic characters of the play. Um, one of the characters, Elliot Green, is a theoretical physicist. I want to emphasize that it's not me, it's not based on me. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot's story is not my story, his problems are not my problems, I have other problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the character of Elliot and the trajectory of the play was already written before they had seen Time of Born and before they had gotten in touch with me. But from Time of Born, I have a sense they got the theme in which Eliot, as a physicist who thinks about time, and time comes up in the play, by the way, he likes the play, time comes up all the time in big and small ways in the play, in the interactions of the characters. Um, but also, Eliot is a character who is concerned with the nature of time, and he undergoes a change of mind in the play about the nature of time, and that is the same change of mind that I went through 
which during the project with Roberto, which resulted in the book Time of Born. So the play is a beautiful dramatization of a change of mind about the nature of time. And that is thematically related to the change of mind that I went through. And because of that, I think I was able to help. And I must say that Hannah and the director, Ross, and the actors who are fabulous actors, I know in the theater we're supposed to say everybody's fabulous, but they really are. <laughs> As I said, I've been watching theater since my mother was a child, since I was about four years old, and I saw The Wizard of Oz on stage. And then the next year, when I was five years old, my mother took me to see Medea. <laughs> <laughs> At the public theater, you know, directed by Joseph Pop, the theater in Central Park, which was near where we lived. Yeah, and what was she in mind? I've asked her about it since. <laughs> Anyway, I've been watching actors for a long time, and these really are fabulous actors. Um, and they really do dramatize well this intellectual change of heart and change of mind about the nature of time. Um, but they also, the play is partly about that, but the play is <coughs> both an intellectual story, but as much or even more a personal story about these characters and their lives and their families and their interrelations and ultimately about love and their love for each other. Um, now, I thought what I would do, so that's, that's my involvement in the play. I, I saw a couple of rehearsals and run-throughs. Um, I, I, oh yes, I, um, Elliot, since he works in my field, and that was the case before, Hannah and I talked. Um, Hannah and Ross invited me to provide the backstory for Elliot, and also a little bit for Sarah Jean, who's a mathematician, um, who's the third character. The characters are Elliot Carmen, who's a composer, and Sarah Jean, who's a mathematician. So you see, those are different ways of getting at time, through physics, through music, and through mathematics. And that's partly the intellectual structure of the play, as well as the play is built around, of course, the interpersonal issues that they have. But I was invited to write the scientific backstory, and so I took great advantage of that. And um, so Elliot does from time to time, and Sarah Jean a little less, talk, craft, or shop. Um, nothing that should bother you or intimidate you, you know since they're talking to other characters who are not scientists. Um, but I got to make some of that up. And is there anybody here who is a physicist or a mathematician? So you'll see that there, there, there's some little in-jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so I should go in to laugh then. Yeah, if just this guy laughs, then... <laughs> I, I, I was told that Elliot is indeed a great scientist, that, that he has great contributions. And so I gave him great things to have accomplished, which, um, which my generation has failed to accomplish. <laughs> so I got to, why not take advantage if you're given the opportunity and give somebody the chance at least on stage to get it right. <laughs> So, so anyway, so that's the, so that's the little bit. And Paul, who plays Elliot, is just great at saying things like two fineness of superstring theory with the right order and enunciation. <laughs> which I've worked with actors who were for trained scientists before in New York, and it's it's it's, it's incredibly easy to get that stuff wrong. Again, only this guy here would, would know this <laughs> but, but this is the kind of theater company that cares about getting stuff like that right, and they did work on getting it right. Okay, so um, what I prepared, you see, there is, when physicists give talks to the public, there's always a PowerPoint. Which is we're cool guys and we use Apple stuff. Um, <laughs> And, um, but, um, but I thought I would give you a, a little sample from the talk that I give about Time Reborn to give you some 
sense of what's at stake about the change of mind that Elliot goes through in the play. But before I do that, let me just ask if there are any questions about what I, the intro that I've said so far. Because I'm not going to give the whole book tour talk. You're not here because of the book, you're here because of the play. But I thought after some questions, I'll give you a little taste of what the whole point is. No questions? Okay. So this is the cover of the book. That's the British version of the book. <laughs> You know, the British are like that, they have to have their own cover. <laughs> um, that's Roberto, and if there are any experts, um, our book, which was, the, which is the report for academics, come, came out from Cambridge University Press a few months ago. Um, but if you're a member of the public club, you can read the book. This is an attempt at doing science, and one of the worries is that the kind of science I do is kind of stuck. So, for example, if you read the popular science press, you hear a lot about multi-universities and internal inflation, and there being an infinite number of universities, and there being an infinite number of every one of us sitting here in this room. But there's really some that one of you is sitting on stage and I'm in the audience at some of these universities. Actually, that's true in an infinite number of these universities. It's all this nonsense, <laughs> which is in response to the crisis that I'll get to. So I thought it's important to remind ourselves about what science is to start with. And, you know, philosophers debate a lot about what the nature of science is and how it works. And um, I have followed some of this and even contributed some to this discussion. But the very best characterization, I'm not kidding, of the nature of science was um, found, I discovered listening to a CD that somebody had given to my son, who's eight years old, Kai. By the way, there's an eight-year-old child in the play also. And they get that right, too. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who, who have had or have young children. Um, the, the rock and roll band from Brooklyn, they might be giants, have a CD about science. And this is what they have to say. Um, I, I can probably do this by heart, but I'll read because I'm lazy. I like the stories about angels, unicorns, and elves. I like the stories as much as anybody else. When it comes to seeking knowledge, simple or abstract, the facts are with science. And here's the point. The scientific theory isn't just a hunch or a guess. It's more like a question that's been put through a lot of tests. When a theory emerges consistent with the facts, the truth is with science, the truth is with science. And so there are, just like it's hard to get theater right, it's hard to do science, it's hard to break new ground, it's hard to make real breakthroughs. And in the field that Elliot and I work, which is the field of trying to, to discover and articulate fundamental laws of nature, there hasn't been a lot of progress since the middle 70s. And that's the context in which Elliot finds himself working in, and in which I've confronted, and in which Elliot succeeds and everybody else in the whole universe fails. So, so that's some of the background for the play. Now, science began with the discussion of the nature of time. Anaximander was the pre-Socratic in Greece. Um, he was said by some to be the first scientist. And this is the only fragment of him that we actually have first hand. It's not second hand. And he says, all things originate from one another and vanish into one another according to necessity in conformity with the order of time. And so you see, for Anaximander, time was central to his conception of nature, and the flow of time, and the presence of time of the present moment, it's always a moment now, and then it's the next moment, and then it's the next moment, this is what we all experience. And for Anaximander, that was the core of science, because that was the core of reality. Now, Elliot and myself, and almost everybody, 
for the last hundred years in our field has disbelieved that time was a fundamental aspect of the world. Instead, we believed, oh, there's a nostalgia. Actually, that was not, I was, no, no, that was Albert Einstein, that's a different guy. Okay. <laughs>
that's what's at stake. If it's, if it's true or false already now, then it's locked in. And we can advocate and vote and you know, buy hybrid cars and electric cars, but it's already locked in with the temperature is going to be. It doesn't matter. We have no responsibility, etc. But if it's not locked in, if the future doesn't yet exist, if the future is different from the present and the past, and that the present exists, the past is always exists, and the future is yet to exist, it might be open, then it matters whether we buy hybrid or electric cars or who we vote for this next year. Can we really choose to influence that? That's what's at stake. That's the same thing as asking if time is real. Or if time is an illusion. Did you get it? But is it the statement that is real? Or an illusion? I mean, it's people who are holding that statement. Good. <laughs> so, my response to that, I'm not a philosopher, although I, I, I have to admit I have an adjunct position at the philosophy department over the university. <laughs> So I, I will duck behind a veil of pragmatism. That is, you know what I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let the scholars and the sort out that. Not to, but, but that is worth sorting out. I'm just, I know where my level of confidence is and where it isn't. Thank you. Do you want to come back? What's my definition of real? I believe, I'm a naturalist, I believe that the world exists outside of my perception and that tables and chairs exist and you all exist and that's my definition of real. I, I think that there are a lot of things that exist out there that are not my perception, that are recalcitrant to my desires and wishes and so there's a category of things that really exist besides my perception and when I say, I'll, I'll get to what I mean when I say the time is real. When I, but I'm just, now let me just be informal and I'll, you can nail me to the wall in five or ten slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is about reality and it's also about truth. As I mentioned with the statement about climate change, is truth timeless? Or is all truth true? I realize I'm pointing at this screen, but you can't see the screen. So <laughs> see, if I was a better actor, I would know that. <laughs> is truth timeless, or is all truth true in the moment? If the moment is all that exists at any moment, then anything that's true, whether it's in the past or the future, has to be true about something in the moment. Look at your heart, <laughs> Climate change is not a left-right issue, it's not an environmental issue, it's a national defense and national security issue. And if you don't think that's true, then go read about what the militaries of the world are, are thinking and saying and writing to each other about climate change. Anybody who thinks it's an environmental issue hasn't thought it through. It's not about the environment, it's about us. Go ahead and answer. <laughs> Different way of asking the same questions. 
Is novelty really possible? If the future is just a rearrangement to the present, then nothing really new ever happens. Novelty is impossible. By the way, if you're a European, and I've lived in Europe, I, I had to choose between living in England and coming and telling me to start the Berlin Institute here. The greatest difference between North America and like ourselves and Europeans is that Europeans believe that novelty is impossible. If you can have an idea, somebody had that idea 3,000 years ago, or at least 300 years ago. Whereas the advantage that we get over on this side of the ocean, whether it's Canada or the United States or Mexico or Brazil, is we believe in the possibility of novelty. Well, then how do they think that there could have been novelty when the first person thought of it? <laughs> I would have done that, but thank you. I'm on your side. Of course, if you go live in California, then, every, then everybody can reinvent themselves, and that's not true either. <laughs> if we knew everything about instance, could we be surprised by the next instance? This is just to get you, again, give you an idea of what to say. Now, if you think about cosmology, and Elliot is a cosmologist, partly not a cosmologist. I actually got a prize for being a cosmologist last year, which is pretty cool because it's not so that you ever studied. <laughs> but the question to ask is, are there laws that apply not just to cups of water, you know, heating up and coming to the same temperature, and balls flowing down and climbing planes, and things falling off of towers and everything and so forth. Do the laws of nature apply to the whole universe or just to little parts of it? That turns out to be an important question. Murphy. Did you Murphy's laws. <laughs> that applies to the whole universe. <laughs> Yes. Everybody told me not to see it, and I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, wasn't there a discovery kind of recently that the fundamental laws of physics are different and far away parts of the universe? Not that anybody told me, but <laughs> not in the last few years. Um, there is a, there is a, there have been attempts to measure the constants in the laws of nature far away and long ago, because you have to be long ago to go far away. Yeah. And using light from quasars, which get out to about a redshift of five or six, if you know what that is. And there are disputed measurements that say that the charge of the electron is different by about a part of a hundred thousand. Um, It's, it's, it's contested. This is about 10 years old, this measurement. The latest version of it is that, is that that's confirmed, but in some directions it's less, and in some directions it's a little bit greater, which is even weirder. But other, other experimental groups don't see the effect at all. But this is the kind of question to say, are the laws of nature eternal or could they change? I'm, I'm going to come to that. I may not come to that because We'll run out of time and get to see the real play and not the stand-in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, here is at my stage in life what, what I'm wondering. <laughs> Do we have more or less freedom as we grow older? Does having lived for a certain amount of time give us more agency or less agency? And I'd like to think, although I never discussed this with Hannah, that this is one of the questions that her characters are struggling with. And to come back to the issue of climate change, what is the wise response to future risks in which we genuinely don't know the future? Now, the point is that in physics, for the last several hundred years, there's been developing an answer to this which is, to me, dispiriting, but you know, it's very strongly argued. Fundamentally, nothing happens except rearrangement of atoms. We're all made of atoms, our brains are made of atoms, our experiences are the result of some chemistry around the brain, everything is just the motion of atoms. The motion of atoms follows laws, 
the laws tell us if you know the present state of all the atoms, what the future state will be. If you know the present motion, what the future motion is. Therefore, nothing's going on fundamentally but rearrangement of atoms. According to laws, they're deterministic. Everything else is an illusion, including novelty. And everything that we peg to time, such as agency, morality, choice, freedom, responsibility, is an illusion. Free will is impossible. That's what Elliot believes at the start of the planet, that's what Now, there is actually a theatrical precedent for worrying about this. How many of you saw Tom Stoppard's Al Many times. Many times, great. I just saw it once, but I read it. Um, and Tom Stoppard has a character he names after himself called Tom Cena, who is a young woman who is a prodigy living a uh, hundred or I forget how many years in the past. And she comes to her tutor with his query. So you can stop every atom in its position and direction, and if you want to comprehend all the actions thus suspended, then if you were really, 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 really good at algebra, you could write the formula for all the future. And this is where Tom Stockard is brilliant. He gets the point. And although nobody can be so clever as to do that, the formula must exist just as if one could. And therefore the future is locked in. Now, if she were a modern character, she would say instead, if you were really, really, really good at programming, and you have <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is important because of the nonsense that some colleagues and friends of mine write about the world, the universe being a computer, and the real sophisticated ones write about this being a quantum computer. Same difference from this point of view. And there's a whole, my, my friend Jaron Lanier, who's a kind of co-conspirator, in this whole project. Is that what, do any of you know about Jaron? Jaron Lanier invented virtual reality. And in six months, he's going to be announced for Microsoft classes that you put on your head and put yourself in altered reality called HoloLens, which he invented. But he's also a musician, a composer, and a humanist. And he writes books against the notion that we're all computers. And he argues that every time we interact with each other across Facebook or what's it called? The 37 words, twit. Twitter. <laughs> Every time we interact with each other through these meetings, we're using algorithms that are written by people that imagine that we are computers just like the computers that we use to intermediate or socialize. And therefore, our social lives are becoming mechanistic and dehumanized because they're being intermediated not only by algorithms, but by algorithms written by people who think that we're also algorithms. <laughs> and this is what Jaron is opposed to. Well, we kind of um, like every, every part that is a human is made up of electrical systems or biological systems, and those things are look to serve a purpose. So... No, I know there's a case to be made, but I think the case fails. I know there's a case that I'm making, Thomas Cena is making this case. Let me tell you where I think, and if I get time, I'll tell you where it fails. I just can read Jaron. His book is called, You Are Not a Gadget, and then his next book is called, Who Owns the Future? Because not only are people changing the way we interact with each other by making algorithms, modeled on the idea we're algorithms, but they're making fortunes doing it. Yeah. So, anyway, um, in Thomasina's computer program, she managed to would input into the computer, the computer program is like the laws of nature, you would input into it the present positions of all the atoms, or the present <coughs> quantum states, and would output their future positions. And there are people who believe the world is a computer like that, and functions like that, and it's just a question of learning what the algorithm is. And the algorithm is just the contemporary way of saying the equation which unifies everything. And that's what Elliot is after in the play. That's what drives him and obsesses him, is the possibility of coming up with the equation that governs the future that Thomas Cena is trying to capture. <coughs> but here's the, where time disappears. The whole universe can be exactly emulated by 
formula or a computer program, then time is unreal or inessential. Why? Because the running of the computer program is just a sequence of logical operations or the evaluation of the mathematical formula of Thomasina is just a series of logical operations which is either correct or incorrect outside of time. So therefore, the processes by which the world evolves are emulatable by logic which is outside of time, so time is an essential. Time is an illusion. This is the way that people argue. And if anybody here has a background in philosophy, this is the A theory versus the B theory of somebody from early in the 20th century. Thomasina is thinking about what happens in time from an imaginary perspective outside of time. When she imagines there's a formula that governs the world, she's imagining that she can know that formula and therefore see the world from outside of time. So it's a struggle between seeing the world inside of time and thinking in time, being part of the process as the world evolves, versus thinking outside of time. When we think that our experiences are illusions, what was really real is outside of time. And that's what's at stake. Like when we imagine that the world is really not matter. Now, at the beginning of the play, Eliot has the common illusion that there's a mathematical formula common to people of his and my kind. There's a mathematical formula that Thomasina is looking for, which is timeless and beautiful, and which is the real essence of the world. He's looking to transcend the messy reality of his human life with his messy upbringing and his messy personal relationships by grasping on and transcending to the beauty and truth that is behind the world and is expressible in mathematics. And Sarah Jean, who is the character who is a mathematician, is seeking to do the same thing. And you'll see that, if you look for it in the play, you'll see her reaching for numbers to comfort herself. And Carmen, who is the third character in the play, is what? Is a musician and a composer. What is music? Indeed, the theme of Music is pattern, and pattern is mathematics. And capturing pattern timelessly is behind the passion of Eliot and Carmen. So this is how the themes of the play on an emotional level are woven into these intellectual themes. And I'll leave you with just one set of comments. This is by a blogger called Sabina Hassenfeld, who is a professor at Nordita in our field. And she's quoting Max Tegmark, who is a very famous cosmologist at MIT, who had a book last year arguing that the whole universe is just a mathematical structure. So she says, or thinks, Max Tegmark says the whole universe is a mathematical structure. So you must believe he is a mathematical structure. And I, too, am a mathematical structure. I wonder what it feels like being a mathematical structure. <laughs> and I'll leave you there. It's a hard problem on two levels. Thinking about probability and what probability means, and whether in probability we're talking about degree of belief, or whether we're talking about number of times in a large set that something occurs. When we say it's 30% probable to rain tomorrow, are we really talking about our belief, or are we talking about the fact that on a thousand similar days, roughly 300 of them will be rainy? And that's hard enough to parse because what if it's not? Did we disprove the contention? Or what if it's 95% probable that it's going to rain and it doesn't rain? Did we disprove that? It's really hard. It's, what if it's 99.999% probable that it doesn't rain? Did that disprove that statement? It's really hard to think about that. 
And then when you throw a quantum theory on top of that. So, um, I think that this probabilities in quantum theory are secretly referring to the size of the universe. That is, when you're talking about the probability of an electron and the hydrogen atom is on this side of the atom, not on that side of the atom. You're really talking about compared to all the atoms which are similar in the whole universe. So I think that chance is not real. It's really all relative to a large but finite universe. But that's just what I think. Yeah? So you threw at us the issue of multiple universes, which seems to be discredited now. But uh, it's not discredited. Some of my <laughs> most famous and successful cosmology colleagues um, believe strongly in it. Andre Linde was in Alan Booth who invented the hypothesis of inflation, which is almost demonstrated, not quite, but there's a lot of evidence for it. Believe that believe in multiple universes. A lot of smart, you know, people believe in it. I think it's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the end of science. I think it's a betrayal of, of the practice of science, as I quoted as they might be giant still for sure. But well, the curveball that uh, quantum physics threw at us was either we have the multiverse or we have consciousness. So I would I would be curious to find out is what are your thoughts on the world of consciousness? <laughs> uh, if I were an actor, I would use the tears and that's what I I have a very dear friend here in Toronto, who I'm not going to name, but who I mentioned in the time we were born in the epilogue, who is in his 90s and has... Um, <coughs> lived widely and been influential and also had a lifelong intensive spiritual investigation. And I let him talk to me about consciousness. He's on the right. <laughs> to everybody else, yeah, I, uh, who knows? I really, it's, consciousness is the hardest question. I think it's a real question. I think science is not yet equipped. We do not yet have the understanding or vocabulary of the natural world to understand why quality and kinds of experiences are part of the natural world. As a naturalist who believes that everything is part of the natural world, I believe that consciousness must be understood as part of the natural world. But we don't have the basis to do it yet. And I don't expect to see it in my lifetime or my children's lifetime. Child's lifetime, sorry. <laughs> so I respect the question, but I I don't know what to say about it. I'm sure that it's not an illusion. The, 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 the neuroscientists who think that we're all just computers and consciousness is an essential illusion, I think they're out to lunch. But I don't have anything better to present. <laughs> Are we just some kind of artifact of time, you know, some sort of nexus of infinity and eternity? You know, that's outside my, my expertise as <laughs> well. Uh, but my friend Roberto Mani Veranger likes to say that we are beings who can think and dream of infinity caught in bodies which constrain us to finite lives. Yeah. I know what time is, but I don't understand it. Uh, where do you stand? I didn't get to that part of the talk. <laughs> so, let me say that I agree with Elliot by the end of the play. Yeah. Do you believe time is measurable in the sense the way we measure it um, by the clock? Or is it measurable in other ways? There is something which is measurable. We can build clock. By the way, watch out for the clock in the play. It's, it's very subtle, but the clock does play a role. I have to, this, this was the third time I saw it that I caught on to that. Um, 
We build clocks, our processes, which repeat greatly enough that we can use them to label when things happen. As a general relativist, I believe that any clock is as good as any other clock. It doesn't matter if some of them speed up or slow down or, or funky. Um, so they're just ways of labeling events. And any way of labeling events that distinguishes them, because every event is different from every other event, but we need labels to distinguish them, to keep records, to do experiments. So I think the clocks are, are physical devices we reconstruct to help us label, record, and systematize our observations of the world. Do I think that that fully encompasses the nature of time and the experience of the passage of time? No. No. So how would you measure it? Yeah, or is it measurable, I guess is the question. I would turn it around and say things that are measurable are things that we can build devices that can take reliable records of things that happened. We, science is most comfortable on grounds where you can keep records of observations because you can repeat experiments and check your work check your ideas and check your hypotheses. Do I believe that that fully encompasses the natural world? No. Yeah. Um, with respect to climate change, uh, there seem to be two uh, approaches. One being, we need to do something and then we can um, mitigate climate change. The other one is, oh, it's all going to work out, uh, or I have no control over it anyway, so relax. What impact do you think technology has, and particularly the algorithms of the technology, on our collective way of thinking? Well, te let me first just say the problem is very solvable with technology. Hmm. There's a recent study from a group of Canadian climate scientists that basically says that Canada could meet its the, the goals for, what is it, 80% cut by 2015 carbon emissions by wiring the country east to west rather than making a lot of electricity in the east and sending it south to that country in the south. Um, so at least as, as far as this country, the problem is very, is very possible. Um, I think that there is a there's a deeper aspect to your question, and I address it in the epilogue of Time Reborn. I, I think that a too rigid a view of categories and properties, which comes with the idea that the world, the world is timeless, if what's really true is timeless, things are being sorted into timeless categories, and when we get too rigid about those categories, we block the ability to, to identify solutions because we can't think past certain barriers. And I think the distinction between the natural world and the artificial world is one such barrier. And I think that, but for le to me, the lesson of climate change is that human beings participate in the cycles of natural processes on the planet. And it's inevitable that as we develop our numbers and our civilizations, we would begin to have economic processes which are massive enough to impinge on the already natural processes. Uh, and it's not a question of backing off. We can't go back to when there were only a billion of us. At least that would be a catastrophe much worse than anything that climate change would bring on. And therefore we have to learn to blend the natural and the artificial and become stewards of the climate. So it's a transition which is revolutionary, but it's not unlike the transition to agriculture, which we went through 12,000 years ago successfully. So do you, our ability, you say, well, actually, the solution's out there. What do you see as us not? There's, the solution has two stages. There's the immediate issue, which is bringing the carbon production down to the point where the planet doesn't heat up to the point where it becomes really, really dramatically terrible. I mean, there are really bad things that can happen if the temperature goes up to 8 or 10 degrees. That's the first stage. The second stage is the long-term issue, which goes on for hundreds of years. It goes on for the whole future of human civilization. How do we live in harmony with the finite planet? 
And that requires, I believe, breaking down the boundary between saying that's artificial, that's technology, and that's natural, that's to be protected. That's why I don't think climate change is an environmental issue. It's not about protecting the natural world. It's about going through a revolution that unifies our civilizations and economies and technologies with the natural world, wisely. <coughs> I think this will have to be the last question. <laughs> oh, one more? Yes. Okay. I, I just finished reading a book called The Universe from Nothing. And I think it has something to do with time. Have you read it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's by Lawrence Krauss. Oh, I know Lawrence. And, and we were your, young colleagues together in Yale. So what is your view on that book and its implications for the end of the universe? I think, I, I'm a huge fan of Lawrence. I think he's done great service fighting the battles of science, for example, against creationism in favor of evolution. Um, he's a very clear and very articulate thinker. He expresses himself very well. I think he's out of his depth when he's confronting philosophical issues like whether you know, something can come from nothing. He misunderstands what the philosopher's issues are. And I think it's unfortunate because he's a very brilliant and articulate thinker, and I think he just misstepped there. <laughs> <laughs>